This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joy Chan. Mysticism, a study in nature and development of spiritual consciousness by Evelyn Underhill. Second half of part two, chapter four. Consider the accent of realism with which St. Augustine speaks of his own experience of platonic contemplation, a passage in which we seem to see a born psychologist desperately struggling by means of negations to describe an intensely positive state. I enter it into the secret closet of my soul, led by thee, and this I could do because thou wast my helper. I entered and beheld with the mysterious eye of my soul the light that never changes, above the eye of my soul, above my intelligence. It was not the common light which all flesh can see, nor was it greater yet of the same kind, as if the light of day were to grow brighter and brighter and flood all space. It was not like this, but different, altogether different from all such things. Nor was it above my intelligence in the same way as oil is above water or heaven above earth, but it was higher because it made me, and I was lower because made by it. He who knoweth the truth knoweth that light, and he who knoweth it knoweth eternity. Love knoweth it. Here, as in the cases of St. Teresa, St. Catherine of Genoa, and Jacopone da Todi, we have a characteristically immanental description of the illuminated state. The self, by the process which mystics call introversion, the deliberate turning inwards of its attention, its cognitive powers, discerns reality within the heart. The rippling tide of love which flows secretly from God into the soul, and draws it mightily back into its source. But the opposite, or transcendental tendency, is not less frequent. The cosmic vision of infinity, exterior to the subject, the expansive, outgoing movement towards a divine light. Che visible face, lo creatore a quella creatura, che solo in lui vedera alla sua pace. Wholly other than anything the earth-born creature can conceive, the strange, formless absorption in the divine dark to which the soul is destined to ascend, all these modes of perception are equally characteristic of the illuminative way. As in conversion, so here reality may be apprehended in either transcendent or imminent, positive or negative terms. It is both near and far, closer to us than our most inward part, and higher than our highest. And for some selves, that which is far is easiest to find. To a certain type of mind, the veritable practice of the presence of God is not the intimate and adorable companionship of the personal comrade or the inward light, but the awestruck contemplation of the Absolute, the naked Godhead, source and origin of all that is. It is an ascent to the supernal plane of perception, where the simple, absolute, and unchangeable mysteries of heavenly truth lie hidden in the dazzling obscurity of the secret silence, outshining all brilliance with the intensity of their darkness, and surcharging our blinded intellects with the utterly impalpable and invisible fairness of glories which exceed all beauty. With such an experience of eternity, such a vision of the triune, all-including absolute, which binds the universe with love. Dante ends his divine comedy, and the mystic joy with which its memory fills him is his guarantee that he has really seen the inviolate rose, the flaming heart of things. O abbondante grazia, ondio prosunsi, ficca lo viso per la luce eterna, tanto che la veduta vi consunsi. Nel suo profonde vide che s'interna, legato con amore in volume, ciò che per l'universo si squaderna. Sustanzie et accidente, e lo costume, quasi conflati insieme per tal modo, che ciò che io dico è in semplice lume. La forma universal di questo nodo, credo che io vidi, per se più di lago, dicendo questo, mi sento che io godo. O quanto è colto il dire, e come fio co il mio concetto, e questo è quel ch'io vidi, e tanto che non basta e dice poco. O luce eterna, che sola in te sidi, sole t'intendi, e date intelletta, ed intendente te, e mi ed aridi. 
O oh, grace abounding, wherein I presumed to fix my gaze on the eternal light, so long that I consumed my sight thereon. In its depths I saw ingathered the scattered leaves of the universe, bound into one book by love. Substance and accident and their relations, as if fused together in such a manner that what I tell of is a simple light, and I believe that I saw the universal form of this complexity, because, as I say this, I feel that I rejoice more deeply. Oh, but how scant the speech, and how faint to my concept, and that to what I saw as such, that it suffices not to call it little. O oh, little eternal, who only in thyself abidest, only thyself dost comprehend, and of thyself comprehended, and thyself comprehending, dost love and smile. In Dante, the transcendent and impersonal aspect of illumination is seen in its most exalted form. It seems at first sight almost impossible to find room within the same system for this expansive vision of the undifferentiated light and such intimate and personal apprehensions of deity as Lady Julian's conversations with her courteous and dear-worthy lord or St. Catherine's companionship with love divine. Yet all these are really reports of the same psychological state. Describe the attainment by selves of different types of the same stage in the soul's progressive apprehension of reality. In a wonderful passage, unique in the literature of mysticism, Angela Foligno has reported the lucid vision in which she perceived this truth, the twofold revelation of an absolute at once humble and omnipotent, personal and transcendent, the unimaginable synthesis of unspeakable power and deep humility. The eyes of my soul were opened, and I beheld the plenitude of God, wherein I did comprehend the whole world, both here and beyond the sea and the abyss and ocean and all things. In all these things I beheld naught save the divine power, in a manner assuredly indescribable, so that through excess of marvelling the soul cried with a loud voice, saying, This whole world is full of God. Wherefore I now comprehended how small a thing is the whole world, that is to say, both here and beyond the seas, the abyss, the ocean and all things, and that the power of God exceeds and fills all. Then he said unto me, I have shown thee something of my power, and I understood that after this I should better understand the rest. He then said, Behold now my humility. Then was I given an insight into the deep humility of God towards man, and comprehending that unspeakable power, and beholding that deep humility, my soul marvelled greatly, and did esteem itself to be nothing at all. It must never be forgotten that all apparently one-sided descriptions of illumination, more all experience of it, are governed by temperament. That light whose smile kindles the universe is ever the same, but the self through whom it passes, and by whom we must receive its report, has already submitted to the moulding influences of environment and heredity, church and state. The very language of which that self avails itself in its struggle for expression links it with half a hundred philosophies and creeds. The response which it makes to divine love will be the same in type as the response which its nature would make to earthly love, but raised to the nth degree. We, receiving the revelation, receive with it all those elements which the subject has contributed in spite of itself. Hence the soul's apprehension of divine reality may take almost any form, from the metaphysical ecstasies which we find in Dionysius, to a less degree in St. Augustine, to the simple, almost common-sense statements of Brother Lawrence, the emotional ardours of St. Gertrude, or the lovely intimacies of Julian or Mechthild. Sometimes, so rich and varied does the nature of the great mystic tend to be, the exalted and impersonal language of the Dionysian theology goes, with no sense of incongruity, side by side with homely parallels drawn from the most sweet and common incidents of daily life. Suso, in whom illumination and purgation existed side by side for sixteen years, alternately obtaining possession of the mental field, and whose oscillations between the harshest mortification and the most ecstatic pleasure states were exceptionally violent and swift, is a characteristic instance of such an attitude of mind. His illumination was largely of the intimate and immanental type, 
but, as we might expect in a pupil of Eckhart, it was not without touches of mystical transcendence, which break out with sudden splendour side by side with those tender and charming passages in which the servitor of the eternal wisdom tries to tell his love. Thus he describes in one of the earlier chapters of his life how, whilst he was thinking, according to his custom, of the most lovable wisdom, he questioned himself and interrogated his heart, which sought persistently for love, saying, O oh my heart, whence comes this love and grace? Whence comes this gentleness and beauty, this joy and sweetness of the heart? Does not all this flow forth from the Godhead as from its origin? Come, let my heart, my senses, and my soul immerse themselves in the deep abyss whence come these adorable things. What shall keep me back? Today I will embrace you, even as my burning heart desires to do. And at this moment there was within his heart, as it were, an emanation of all good, all that is beautiful, all that is lovable and desirable was there spiritually present, and this in a manner which cannot be expressed. Whence came the habit that every time he heard God's praises sung or said, he recollected himself in the depths of his heart and soul, and thought on that beloved object, whence comes all love? It is impossible to tell how often, with eyes filled with tears and open heart, he has embraced his sweet friend, and pressed him to a heart overflowing with love. He was like a baby which a mother holds upright on her knees, supporting it with her hands beneath its arms. The baby, by the movement of its little head and all its little body, tries to get closer and closer to its dear mother, and shows by its little laughing gestures the gladness in its heart. Thus did the heart of the servitor ever seek the sweet neighbourhood of the divine wisdom, and thus he was, as it were, altogether filled with delight. 2. THE ILLUMINATED VISION OF THE WORLD Closely connected with the sense of the presence of God, or power of perceiving the Absolute, is the complementary mark of the illuminated consciousness, the vision of a new heaven and a new earth, or an added significance and reality in the phenomenal world. Such words as those of Julian, God is all thing that is good as to my sight, and the goodness that all thing hath, it is he, seem to supply the link between the two. Here again we must distinguish carefully between vaguely poetic language, the light that never was, every common bush afire with God, and descriptions which can be referred to a concrete and definite psychological experience. This experience at its best balances and completes the experience of the presence of God at its best. That is to say, its note is sacramental, not ascetic. It entails the expansion rather than the concentration of consciousness. The discovery of the perfect one self-revealed in the many, not the forsaking of the many in order to find the one. Its characteristic expression is, The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. Not turn thy thoughts into thy own soul where he is hid. It takes, as a rule, the form of an enhanced mental lucidity an abnormal sharpening of the senses, whereby an ineffable radiance, a beauty and a reality never before suspected, are perceived by a sort of clairvoyance shining in the meanest things. From the moment in which the soul has received the impression of deity in infused horizon, says Malaval, she sees him everywhere, by one of love's secrets which is only known of those who have experienced it. The simple vision of pure love, which is marvellously penetrating, does not stop at the outer husk of creation. It penetrates to the divinity which is hidden within. Thus Browning makes David declare, I but open my eyes, and perfection, no more, no less, in the kind I imagine full fronts me, and God is seen God, in the star, in the stone, in the flesh, in the soul, and the clod. Blake's to see a world in a grain of sand, Tennyson's flower in the crannied wall, Vaughan's each bush and oak doth know I am, and the like, are exact though over-quoted reports of things seen in this state of consciousness, this simple vision of pure love, the value of which is summed up in Eckhart's profound saying, the meanest thing that one knows in God, for instance if one could understand a flower as it has its being in God, this would be a higher thing than the whole world. Mystical poets of the type of Wordsworth and Walt Whitman seem to possess in a certain degree this form of illumination. 
It is this which Buck, the American psychologist, analyzed under the name of cosmic consciousness. It is seen at its full development in the mystical experiences of Boehm, Fox, and Blake. We will take first the experience of Jacob Boehm, a mystic who owed little or nothing to the influence of tradition, and who furnishes one of the best recorded all-round examples of mystical illumination, exhibiting, along with an acute consciousness of divine companionship, all those phenomena of visual lucidity, automatism, and enhanced intellectual powers which properly belong to it, but are seldom developed simultaneously in the same individual. In Bohm's life, as described in the introduction to the English translation of his collected works, there were three distinct onsets of illumination, all of the pantheistic and external type. In the first, which seems to have happened whilst he was very young, we are told that he was surrounded by a divine light for seven days and stood in the highest contemplation and kingdom of joy. This we may perhaps identify with mystical awakening of the kind experienced by Suso. About the year 1600 occurred the second illumination, initiated by a trance-like state of consciousness, the result of gazing at a polished disc. To this I have already referred. This experience brought with it that peculiar and lucid vision of the inner reality of the phenomenal world in which, as he says, he looked into the deepest foundations of things. He believed that it was only a fancy, and in order to banish it from his mind, he went out upon the green. But here he remarked that he gazed into the very heart of things, the very herbs and grass, and that actual nature harmonized with what he had inwardly seen. Of this same experience, and the clairvoyance which accompanied it, another biographer says, Going abroad in the fields to a green before Nez Gate at Gorlitz, he sat there down, and, viewing the herbs and grass of the field in his inward light, he saw into their essences, use and properties, which were discovered to him by their lineaments, figures and signatures. In the unfolding of these mysteries before his understanding, he had a great measure of joy, yet returned home and took care of his family and lived in great peace and silence, scarce intimating to any these wonderful things that had befallen him. So far as we can tell from his own scattered statements, from this time onwards Bohm must have enjoyed a frequent and growing consciousness of the transcendental world, though there is evidence that he, like all other mystics, knew seasons of darkness, many a shrewd repulse, and times of struggle with that powerful contrarium, the lower consciousness. In 1610, perhaps as the result of such intermittent struggles, the vivid illumination of ten years before was repeated in an enhanced form, and it was in consequence of this, and in order that there might be some record of the mysteries upon which he had gazed, that he wrote his first and most difficult book, The Aurora, or Morning Redness. The passage in which the inspired shoemaker has tried to tell us what his vision of reality was like, to communicate something of the grave and enthusiastic travail of his being, the unspeakable knowledge of things which he attained, is one of those which arouse in all who have even the rudiments of mystical perception the sorrow and excitement of exiles who suddenly hear the accents of home. Like absolute music, it addresses itself to the whole being, not merely to the intellect. Those who will listen and be receptive will find themselves repaid by a strange sense of extended life, an exhilarating consciousness of truth. Here, if ever, is a man who is struggling to speak as he saw, and it is plain that he saw much, as much perhaps as Dante, though he lacked the poetic genius which was needed to give his vision an intelligible form. The very strangeness of the phrasing, the unexpected harmonies and dissonances which worry polite and well-regulated minds, are earnests of the spirit of life crying out for expression from within. Boehm, like Blake, seems drunk with intellectual vision, a God-intoxicated man. In this my earnest and Christian seeking and desire, he says, wherein I suffered many a shrewd repulse, but at last resolved rather to put myself in hazard than give over and leave off. The gate was open to me, that in one quarter of an hour I saw and knew more than if I had been many years together at a university, at which I exceedingly admired, and thereupon turned my praise to God for it. For I saw and knew the being of all beings, the abyss and the abyss, 
and the eternal generation of the Holy Trinity, the descent and the original of the world, and of all creatures through the divine wisdom, knew and saw in myself all the three worlds, namely, the divine, angelical, and paradisical, and the dark world, the original of the nature to the fire, and then thirdly, the external and visible world, being a procreation of external birth from both the internal and spiritual worlds. And I saw and knew the whole working essence in the evil and the good, and the original and existence of each of them, and likewise how the fruitful bearing womb of eternity brought forth. Yet however I must begin to labour in these great mysteries, as a child that goes to school, I saw it as in a great deep in the eternal. For I had a thorough view of the universe as in a chaos, wherein all things are couched and wrapped up, but it was impossible for me to explain the same. Yet it opened itself to me, from time to time, as in a young plant, though the same was with me for the space of twelve years, and as it was as it were breeding, and I found a powerful instigation within me, before I could bring it forth into external form of writing. And whatever I could apprehend with the external principle of my mind, that I wrote down. Close to this lucid vision of the reality of things, this sudden glimpse of the phenomenal in the light of the intelligible world, is George Fox's experience at the age of twenty-four as recorded in his journal. Here, as in Boehm's case, it is clear that a previous and regrettable acquaintance with the doctrine of signatures has to some extent determined the language and symbols under which he describes his intuitive vision of actuality as it exists in the divine mind. Now was I come up in spirit through the flaming sword into the paradise of God. All things were new, and all the creation gave another smell unto me than before, beyond what words can utter. The creation was opened to me, and it was showed me how all things had their names given them, according to their nature and virtue. And I was at a stand in my mind whether I should practice physic for the good of mankind, seeing the nature and virtue of the creatures were so open to me by the Lord. Great things did the Lord lead me unto, and wonderful depths were opened unto me, beyond what can by words be declared. But as people come into subjection to the Spirit of God, and grow up in the image and power of the Almighty, they may receive the word of wisdom that opens all things, and come to know the hidden unity in the eternal being. To know the hidden unity in the eternal being, know it with an invulnerable certainty, in the all-embracing act of consciousness with which we are aware of the personality of those we truly love, is to live at its fullest the illuminated life, enjoying all creatures in God and God in all creatures. Lucidity of this sort seems to be an enormously enhanced form of the poetic consciousness of otherness in natural things, the sense of a unity and separateness, a mighty and actual life beyond that which I can see a glorious reality shining through the phenomenal veil, frequent in those temperaments which are at one with life. The self then becomes conscious of the living reality of that world of becoming, the vast arena of the divine creativity in which the little individual life is immersed. Alike in howling gale and singing cricket, it hears the crying aloud of that word which is through all things everlastingly. It participates actively and open-eyed in the mighty journey of the sun towards the Father's heart, and seeing with purged sight all things and creatures as they are in that transcendent order, detects in them too that striving of creation to return to its centre which is the secret of the universe. A harmony is thus set up between the mystic and life in all its forms. Undistracted by appearance, he sees, feels, and knows it in one piercing act of loving comprehension. And the bodily sight stinted, says Julian, but the spiritual sight dwelled in mine understanding, and I abode with reverent dread, drawing in that I saw. The heart outstrips the clumsy senses, and sees, perhaps for an instant, perhaps for long periods of bliss, an undistorted and more veritable world. All things are perceived in the light of charity, and hence under the aspect of beauty. For beauty is simply reality seen with the eyes of love, as in the case of another and more beatific vision, essere in caritate e qui necesse. For such a reverent and joyous sight, the meanest accidents of life are radiant. 
The London streets are paths of loveliness. The very omnibuses look like coloured archangels, their laps filled full of little trustful souls. Often when we blame our artists for painting ugly things, they are but striving to show us a beauty to which we are blind. They have gone on ahead of us, and attained that state of fourfold vision to which Blake laid claim, in which the visionary sees the whole visible universe transfigured, because he has put off the rotten rags of sense and memory, and put on imagination uncorrupt. In this state of lucidity, symbol and reality, nature and imagination are seen to be one, and in it are produced all the more sublime works of art, since these owe their greatness to the impact of reality upon the artistic mind. I know, says Blake again, that this world is a world of imagination and vision. I see everything I paint in this world, but everybody does not see alike. To the eye of a miser, a guinea is far more beautiful than the sun, and a bag worn with the use of money has more beautiful proportions than a vine filled with grapes. The tree which moves some to tears of joy is in the eyes of others only a green thing which stands in the way. Some see nature all ridicule and deformity, and by these I shall not regulate my proportions. And some scarce see nature at all. But to the eyes of the man of imagination, nature is imagination itself. As a man is, so he sees. As the eye is formed, such are its powers. You certainly mistake when you say that the visions of fancy are not to be found in this world. To me this world is all one continued vision of fancy or imagination, and I feel flattered when I am told so. If the mystic way be considered as an organic process of transcendence, this illuminated apprehension of things, this cleansing of the doors of perception, is surely what we might expect to occur as man moves towards higher centres of consciousness. It marks the self's growth towards free and conscious participation in the absolute life, its progressive appropriation of that life by means of the contact which exists in the deeps of man's being, the ground or spark of the soul between the subject and the transcendental world. The surface intelligence, purified from the domination of the senses, is invaded more and more by the transcendent personality. The new man, who is by nature a denizen of the independent spiritual world, and whose destiny in mystical language is a return to his origin, hence an inflow of new vitality, a deeper and wider apprehension of the mysterious world in which man finds himself, and the exaltation of his intuitive powers. In such moments of clear sight and enhanced perception as that which Blake and Boehm describe, the mystic and the artist do really see suspicie eternitatis, the fourfold river of life, that world of becoming in which, as Eregina says, every visible and invisible creature is a theophany or appearance of God, as all perhaps might see it, if prejudice, selfhood, or other illusion did not distort our sight. From this loving vision there comes very often that beautiful sympathy with that abnormal power over all living natural things, which crops up again and again in the lives of the mystical saints to amaze the sluggish minds of common men, barred by the torrent of use and want, from all free and deep communion alike with their natural and supernatural origin. Yet it is surely not very amazing that St. Francis of Assisi, feeling and knowing, not merely believing, that every living creature was veritably and actually a theophany or appearance of God, should have been acutely conscious that he shared with these brothers and sisters of his the great and lovely life of the all. Nor, this being so, can we justly regard him as eccentric because he acted in accordance with his convictions, preached to his little sisters the birds, availed himself of the kindly offices of the falcon, enjoyed the friendship of the pheasant, soothed the captured turtle-doves, his simple-minded sisters, innocent and chaste, or persuaded his brother wolf to a better life. The true mystic, so often taunted with a denial of the world, does but deny the narrow and artificial world of self, and finds in exchange the secrets of that mighty universe which he shares with nature and with God. Strange contacts, unknown to those who only lead the life of sense, are set up between his being and the being of all other things. In that remaking of his consciousness which follows upon the mystical awakening, the deep and primal life which he shares with all creation has been roused from its sleep. 
hence the barrier between human and non-human life, which makes man a stranger on earth as well as in heaven, is done away. Life now whispers to his life. All things are his intimates, and respond to his fraternal sympathy. Thus it seems quite a simple and natural thing to the little poor man of Assisi, whose friend the pheasant preferred his cell to the haunts more natural to its state, that he should be ambassador from the terrified folk of Gubbio to his formidable brother the wolf. The result of the interview, reduced to ordinary language, could be paralleled in the experience of many persons who have possessed this strange and incommunicable power over animal life. O oh, wondrous thing! Whereas St. Francis had made the sign of the cross, right so the terrible wolf shut his jaws and stayed his running, and when he was bid, came gently as a lamb and laid him down at the feet of St. Francis. And St. Francis, stretching forth his hand to take pledge of his troth, the wolf lifted up his right paw before him, and laid it gently on the hand of St. Francis, giving thereby such sign of good faith as he was able. Then quoth St. Francis, Brother wolf, I bid thee in the name of Jesu Christ, come now with me, nothing doubting, and let us go establish this peace in God's name. And the wolf obedient set forth with him, in fashion as a gentle lamb, whereat the townsfolk made mighty marvel beholding, and thereafter this same wolf lived two years in a gobio, and went like a tame beast in and out the houses from door to door, without doing hurt to any, or any doing hurt to him, and was courteously nourished by the people. And as he passed thus wise through the country and the houses, never did any dog bark behind him. At length, after a two years' space, Brother Wolf died of old age, whereat the townsfolk sorely grieved, Sith marking him pass so gently through the city, they minded them the better of the virtue and the sanctity of St. Francis. In another mystic, less familiar than St. Francis to English readers, Rose of Lima, the Peruvian saint, this deep sympathy with natural things assumed a particularly lovely form. To St. Rose the whole world was a holy fairyland, in which it seemed to her that every living thing turned its face towards eternity and joined in her adoration of God. It is said in her biography that when at sunrise she passed through the garden to go to her retreat, she called upon nature to praise with her the author of all things. Then the trees were seen to bow as she passed by, and clasp their hands together, making a harmonious sound. The flowers swayed upon their stalks and opened their blossoms that they might scent the air, thus according to their manner praising God. At the same time the birds began to sing, and came and perched upon the hands and shoulders of Rose. The insects greeted her with a joyous murmur, and all which had life and movement joined in the concert of praise she addressed to the Lord. Again, and here we catch an echo of the pure Franciscan spirit, the gaiety of the troubadours of God. During her last Lent, each evening at sunset, a little bird with an enchanting voice came and perched upon a tree beside her window, and waited till she gave the sign to him to sing. Rose, as soon as she saw her little feathered chorister, made herself ready to sing the praises of God, and challenged the bird to this musical duel in a song which she had composed for this purpose. Begin, dear little bird, she said, begin thy lovely song. Let thy little throat so full of sweet melodies pour them forth, that together we may praise the Lord. Thou dost praise thy Creator, I my sweet Saviour. Thus we together bless the Deity. Open thy little beak, begin, and I will follow thee and our voices shall blend in a song of holy joy. At once the little bird began to sing, running through his scale to the highest note. Then he ceased, that the saint might sing in her turn. Thus did they celebrate the greatness of God turn by turn, for a whole hour, and with such perfect order, that when the bird sang, Rose said nothing, and when she sang in her turn, the bird was silent, and listened to her with a marvellous attention. At last, towards the sixth hour, the saint dismissed him, saying, Go, my little chorister, go, fly far away, but blessed be my God who never leaves me. The mystic whose illumination takes such forms as these, who feels with this intensity and closeness the bond of love which binds in one book the scattered leaves of all the universe, dwells in a world unknown to other men. He pierces the veil of imperfection, and beholds creation with the Creator's eye. The pattern is shown him in the mount. 
the whole consciousness, says Récija, is flooded with light to unknown depths under the gaze of love from which nothing escapes. In this stage, intensity of vision and sureness of judgment are equal, and the things which the seer brings back with him when he returns to common life are not merely partial impressions or the separate knowledge of science or poetry. They are rather truths which embrace the world, life and conduct. In a word, the whole consciousness. It is curious to note in those diagrams of experience which we have inherited from the more clear-sighted philosophers and seers, indications that they have enjoyed prolonged or transitory periods of this higher consciousness, described by Reisajar as the marriage of imaginative vision with moral transcendence. I think it at least a reasonable supposition that Plato's doctrine of ideas owed something to an intuition of this kind, for a philosophy, though it may claim to be the child of pure reason, is usually found to owe its distinctive character to the philosopher's psychological experience. The Platonic statements as to the veritable existence of the idea of a house, a table or a bed, and other such concrete and practical applications of the doctrine of the ideal, which have annoyed many metaphysicians, become explicable on such a psychological basis. That illuminated vision in which all things are made new can afford to embrace the homeliest as well as the sublimest things. And, as a matter of experience, it does do this, seeing all objects, as Monet saw the hayrick, as modes of light. Blake said that his cottage at Feltham was a shadow of the angels' houses, as I have already referred to the converted Methodist who saw his horses and hogs on the ideal plain. Again, when Plotinus, who was known to have experienced ecstatic states, speaks with the assurance of an explorer of an intelligible world and asks us, what other fire could be a better image of the fire which is there than the fire which is here? Or what other earth than this of the earth which is there? We seem to detect behind the language of Neoplatonic philosophy a hint of the same type of first-hand experience. The minds to whom we owe the Hebrew Kabbalah found room for it too in their diagram of the soul's ascent towards reality. The first Sephira above Malkuth, the world of matter, or lowest plane upon that tree of life which is formed by the ten emanations of the Godhead, is, they say, Yisod, the archetypal universe. In this are contained the realities, patterns, or ideas, whose shadows constitute the world of appearance in which we dwell. The path of the ascending soul upon the tree of life leads him first from Malkuth to Yisod, i.e., Human consciousness in the course of its transcendence passes from the normal illusions of men to a deeper perception of its environment, a perception which is symbolized by the archetypal plane or world of platonic ideas. Everything in temporal nature, says William Law, is descended out of that which is eternal and stands as a palpable visible outbirth of it, so when we know how to separate the grossness, death and darkness of time from it, we find what it is in its eternal state. In eternal nature, or the kingdom of heaven, materiality stands in life and light. It is the light's glorious body, or that garment wherewith light is clothed, and therefore has all the properties of light in it, and only differs from light as it is its brightness and beauty, as the holder and displayer of all its colours, powers and virtues. When Law wrote this, he may have believed that he was interpreting to English readers the unique message of his master, Jacob Boehm. As a matter of fact, he was reiterating truths which a long line of practical mystics had been crying for centuries into the deaf ears of mankind. He was saying in the 18th century what Gregory of Nyssa had said in the 4th and Erigena in the ninth, telling the secret of that inviolate rose which can never be profaned, because it can only be seen with the eyes of love. That serene and illuminated consciousness of the relation of things inward and outward, of the hidden treasure and its casket, the energizing absolute, and its expression in time and space, which we have been studying in this chapter, is at its best a state of fine equilibrium, a sane adjustment of the inner and outer life. By that synthesis of love and will which is the secret of the heart, the mystic achieves a level of perception in which the whole world is seen and known in God, and God is seen and known in the whole world. 
It is a state of exalted emotion, being produced by love, of necessity it produces love in its turn. The sharp division between its inlooking and outlooking forms, which I have adopted for convenience of description, is seldom present to the minds which achieve it. They cleansed, fed, and sanctified, are initiated into a spiritual universe where such clumsy distinctions have little meaning. All is alike part of the new life of peaceful charity, and that progressive abolition of selfhood, which is of the essence of mystical development, is alone enough to prevent them from drawing a line between the inward personal companionship and outward impersonal apprehension of the real. True illumination, like all real and vital experience, consists rather in the breathing of a certain atmosphere, the living at certain levels of consciousness, than in the acquirement of specific information. It is, as it were, a resting place upon the steep stairway of love, where the self turns and sees all about it a transfigured universe, radiant with that same light divine which nests in its own heart and leads it on. When man's desires are fixed immovably on his maker, as far as for deadliness and corruption of the flesh he is let, says Roll of the purified soul, which has attained the illuminated state, then it is no marvel that his strength manly using, first as it were heaven being opened, with his understanding he beholds high heavenly citizens, and afterwards sweetest heat, as it were burning fire he feels. Then with marvellous sweetness he is taught, and so forth in songful noise he is joyed. This, therefore, is perfect charity, which no man knows but he that hath it took, and he that it has taken, it never leaves. Sweetly he lives, and sickly he shall die. Sweetly, it is true, the illuminated mystic may live, but not, as some think, placidly. Enlightenment is a symptom of growth, and growth is a living process which knows no rest. The spirit indeed is invaded by heavenly peace, but it is the peace not of idleness, but of ordered activity. A rest most busy, in Hilton's words, a progressive appropriation of the divine. The urgent push of an indwelling spirit, aspiring to its home in the heart of reality, is felt more and more as the invasion of the normal consciousness by the transcendental personality. The growth of the new man proceeds towards its term. Therefore the great seekers for reality are not as a rule long delayed by the exalted joys of illumination. Intensely aware now of the absolute whom they adore, they are aware too that though known, he is unachieved. Even whilst they enjoy the rapture of the divine presence, of life in a divine ideal world, something they feel makes default. Sovoglio te, o dolce amore. Hence for them that which they now enjoy, and which passes the understanding of other men, is not a static condition. Often it coexists with that travail of the heart which Toller has called stormy love. The greater the mystic, the sooner he realizes that the heavenly manner which has been administered to him is not yet that with which the angels are full-fed. Nothing less will do, and for him the progress of illumination is a progressive consciousness that he is destined not for the sunny shores of the spiritual universe, but for the vast and stormy sea of the divine. Here, says Rusburick, of the soul which has been lit by the uncreated light, there begins an eternal hunger which shall never more be satisfied. It is the inward craving and hankering of the effective power and created spirit after an uncreated good. And as the spirit longs for fruition, and is invited and urged thereto by God, she must always desire to attain it. Behold, here begin an eternal craving and continual yearning in eternal insatiableness. These men are poor indeed, for they are hungry and greedy, and their hunger is insatiable. Whatsoever they eat and drink, they shall never be satisfied, for this hunger is eternal." Here are great dishes of food and drink, of which none know but those who taste them. But full satisfaction in fruition is the one dish that lacks them, and this is why their hunger is ever renewed. Nevertheless, in this contact, rivers of honey, full of all delight, flow forth, for the spirit tastes these riches under every mode that it can conceive or apprehend. But all this is according to the manner of the creatures, and is below God, and hence there remains an eternal hunger and impatience. 
if God gave to such a man all the gifts which all the saints possess, and all that he is able to give, but without giving himself, the craving desire of the spirit would remain hungry and unsatisfied. End of part two, chapter four.